best if I do this in English, as my Danish tends to deteriorate into my local dialect, if I speak too long time. Um, this is a talk I made up for you guys about what we learned in the Barney's projects during the last 11 years. Um, it's been kind of a, a weird ride. Uh, Barney's was started by Verdensgang, the Norwegian newspaper. They had a, a bunch of really cool DevOps who needed a better caching solution than Squid. And they funded the first version of Varnish and insisted it be open source. My expectation at the time was not really that I would end up writing web server software. I was a, primarily a FreeBSD kernel developer. Um, but it was an interesting task to do in the sense that I could write a program and show people how you use a modern Unix kernel. A lot of people were still writing programs like we were in the 1980s. And we had a lot of new stuff that would be used smarter and get better performance if you used it smarter. And I thought, it's a good way to show people. Write a program that shows them how to do it. So we did version 1 of Varnish. And I sort of expected this may be something that runs on, you know, three Norwegian and a Swedish newspaper or something. And it exploded under our feet, literally. Uh, everybody had been using Squid for web caching purposes on the server side, which it is not built for, and um, tried to get performance out of it, which it could not deliver. And suddenly there were this new hot software and everybody jumped on it. Um, my favorite email is from the US Marines. They did a new recruiting site a website marines.com with high quality video, testimonials, live stories, really, really high quality website. And then they ran TV spots for it on a particular boring Saturday evening where nothing good was really on television. They ran a spot three times and the traffic just went like this because people went to their site and stayed there. So Monday morning, they sent me an email with the subject line of, you saved our ass. <laughs> and I kept that along. I think maybe someday I can call in a, a return favor. <laughs> um, but it's kind of humbling to find yourself sitting at a table where you have Washington Post, New York Times, BBC, Huffington Post, somebody from the federal government who won't tell you which part of the federal government is from Vimeo, Twitter, and Fastly. It's like, okay, <laughs> maybe I should start taking this serious. Um, so we've had a fantastic run, and I've, I've learned a lot during this time. So that's what I want to talk about. Um, if you're interested in computer archaeology, like I am, uh, I dug out some of the old design notes. You can find them on the... Uh, on the Varnish homepage. It's kind of interesting to see how close and how far we hit. Some of the things were spot on, and some of the things were not even in the same postal code as where we ended up. Um, but the main design point seems to have held up well. Um, the one thing they didn't anticipate was success. Um, they didn't anticipate that people would come and say, we need this, 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 and this feature, and this feature, oh, and this feature. In a, a 
coming in much faster than we would have developer resources to deliver these things. Vanish was a one-person project. Right? Um, we didn't plan for that in the sense we hadn't put in modularity the places we should have and so on. But it's kind of interesting to, to look back on it this many years later. So just to set the reference here, we're talking about 2006, right? That's back when Pluto suddenly was no longer a planet. And we're not talking about Mickey Mouse's dog here. We're talking about the thing that used to be a planet. Uh, the last Hadron Collider was almost ready. They planned to start it next year and the pro world probably wouldn't end. Newsflash, it didn't. Um, movies were bored, snakes on a plane, Casino Royale. Taylor Swift's dad bought a record company for her, so she could put out the first single. Um, Saddam Hussein was killed, and North Korea tested their first nuclear bomb. It's a long time ago, this stuff. And somebody came up with SMS over IP and called it Twitter. <coughs> Google bought YouTube. And Italy won, won the World Cup in Germany, which was sort of bonus points kind of thing. Um, Lesson number one, plan only for the future. Um, a lot of software projects start out trying to scratch some itch and therefore tend to be locked into the past. Um, we've seen a lot of projects trying to be a better X than X or Y or C or whoever they want to replace, right? Be a better web server than Apache, be a better editor than Emacs, whatever you want to do. That's the wrong way to think about when you start from scratch. When you start from scratch, you should not think about you want a better car. You should think about how do you want to be transported? It's a different question than, than how to improve a car. Um, Ford said about markets uh, research once that if he had done market research people would have wanted him to come up with a horse that lived on petroleum right and and there's there's a lot of sense to that um, and the other thing in this is that nobody in the past is going to run your code right so you want to be compatible with the future you don't want to be compatible with the past we've had unix computers that had 36 bit words Anybody know which one? Large computer, very important. 36-bit words. Cray one, anyone? Youngsters. Um, we're not going to see a Unix computer having 36-bit words again. It's not going to happen. Um, there's no old compatibility to deal with. We don't need to run on 64-kilobit lines. We don't need to run on 300 bow modems anymore. We know what kind of bandwidth we're dealing with for the future. Um, and, and from a purely mathematical point of view, if you start now, there's potentially infinite amounts of code that will talk to your code in the future. Whereas in the past, that's a finite amount of code. Nobody's writing more code in the past. It's the past. So it's always more important. There's more code to try to work together with <coughs> forwards than back. This was called software engineering in 2006. And I regret to say that I didn't make this screen cap in 2006. I went into user port shell bash and said make configure yesterday. This is utterly insane. How many of you think you would be able to write a program that can compile a system that doesn't have, say, string.h. <laughs> Seriously, right? We're not going to write code that says, oh, in case I don't have standard int, let me do my own type defs. Right? We're working on modern platforms. Um, my favorite deal was you can afford, when you start a new product, to say, forget the old crap. Today, seriously, SunOS, don't bother. Oracle killed it. It's not dead yet, but Oracle killed it. Right? 
Um, lesson number two is the same thing for hardware. Who cares about the VAX 11 780 these days? I know who does, NetBSD. But apart from that, <laughs> right. um, you should aim for hardware you can almost buy. You should aim for the hardware you know is coming 12 month, 15 month down the road, if they're lucky. Um, but you should not aim, you should not look at hardware and say, oh, we're going to make this fantastic thing, we don't know how, we're going to make this, we call it the machine. It will have memory of a kind we don't know how it works, or if we can make it work, but it will be fantastic. Avoid the marketing speed. Look at the machines you can get now, look at what they're doing in the next generation, and that's where you point your point. I can honestly say that back in 2006, I thought, ah, uh, if we're lucky, we'll see vanish machines out of memory. And a couple of days ago, somebody sent me a screenshot from one with a terabyte of RAM. That's what feeling old feels like to me. <laughs> so, look forward. That's the most important thing. In 2006, 32-bit systems were still a thing in the server space. There were still people having servers that could not run 64-bit. And one of the... We had this sort of... of uh, Sneaky marketing plan for Varnish. So, it's 3 a.m., your website ended up on the front page of CNN. What do you do? <coughs> right. You grab your boss's computer, you install Linux or FreeBSD on it, you stick Varnish on it, stick it in front of your web server, change DNS, done. Now your website survives. So we had this sort of, we want to be able to run on any piece of hardware you can lay your hand on. So we said, we're going to do we're going to look squarely at 64-bit, but we want to make sure we run 32-bit. It's not going to work as well, but it will run. But the aim is 64-bit. We don't really care whether it's Itanic, whether it's Spark 64, whether it's ARM 64. That wasn't quite a thing at that point. Or MIPS 64, I should have put that on. But we're aiming at 64-bit, but we'll have 30-bit, 32-bit working. We had the question, should we write this event-driven? where you have a scheduling thread that does a huge select of KQ or EPOL or whatever it does, and then for forks all the work out to a lot of threads, but we to say, we have, no, we have 16 core systems now. We'll have, we'll probably have, you know, 32 bit cores in 10 years or something like that. Uh, we went multi-threaded, massive multi-threaded, because that was clearly the Morse law was done. We, we didn't see clock rates increase. We still haven't seen them increase since then. We saw more and more cores. So we went parallel that way, trying to pick into the future. That seemed to be a good, a good decision. And then we had this discussion. So Anas Baer from, from Verdensgang could pull 100 megabits out of a switch server. We discussed what would be the speed of one. And I'm sort of like, wire speed. I mean, that's not, if we're moving bytes through, from RAM through a network card, wire speed, whatever wire speed. And, and uh, Doug Allen Schmarrow from, from uh, Red Pill Intro was sort of doing the product management on this. He was sort of hedging his bed a bit. So Anna said, you can do it three times as fast. You can do 300 megabit. And then Doug Allen said, nah, nah, you can do hmm, 700 megabit. And I said, wire speed. And they cheated me because they didn't have that much traffic. <laughs> it wasn't until some years later they had some accident in the machine room and ended up buying all of VG on one single varnish machine during some soccer match. Then I won. <laughs> but already then we knew that 10G Ethernets were coming. So we're not aiming at one gigabit performance. We're aiming at wire speed, whatever the wire is. Um, disk or solid state disk, which is a really stupid name for it. Um, I've been working with SSD devices for 10 years at that time. 
There's a small Israeli company called M Systems that did SSD disk for embedded uh, mobile systems, stuff like that, where you couldn't have well, where it has significant vibration environments where you couldn't put disks. They had these small flash devices all poured into epoxy that you couldn't destroy them. Or like that. So I said, yeah, we have a lot of disk around, but we'll have SSDs. We'll aim for the SSDs and, and the disks. And the gigabit, the uh, gigabyte and terabyte thing, I was terribly wrong about that. Uh, kids these days. Um, I haven't heard about any petabyte varnish installations yet. But I know somebody who will get there. So, this is one of the big topics. Try to avoid debugging. Um, write defensive code, write simple code, fail early, clearly, noiselessly. Uh, noisefully. Uh, there's no flaws too trivial to fix. And best of all, the code you don't write don't have any box. This is surprisingly hard for people to understand. Um, the Bash shell has more source code than Varnish does. It's a fucking shell. So let's talk about complexity. Um, many years ago, USA launched the USS Ronald Reagan. And there was a press release from the shipyard that says that they had, had, to, con had to deal with a million things to build it. And I'm kind of like, what do you mean a million things? So I sent an email off to the press contact and I said, what do you mean a million things? I mean, are we talking a million cardboard boxes? Are we talking a million bolts and knots? What is a thing? Mm -hmm. So I, I got an, into an email dialogue with somebody from the warehouse. I said, well, it's basically a million different stock control numbers, a million different item numbers. So I said, what's an item number? He said, well, it can be, you know, like a chair or a nuclear reactor. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you need to keep track of a million things to build a modern aircraft carrier. Some of them are more interesting than others. Right. I'm going to go down to Ali, uh, AliExpress and buy the cheapest smartphone, Android smartphone, with it, and it has 12 million lines of code. That's the same complexity as the largest aircraft carrier in the 12 countries that has aircraft carriers. We're not doing anything anywhere is this in complexity. And we talk about a cheap smartphone that just has Android. It doesn't have anything fancy. So over the time I've built this table and it needs to be explained. <clears throat> if we start with the Apollo 11 line, they spent 150,000 lines land people. It's still debated whether that is actually a bug. Uh, the error they got when they tried to land the first time was not a bug. That gives us a level of coding quality for reference. But it's very useful. The state of the we know that because the very first time they tried to send it up, it didn't work. There's a paper called The Bug Heard Around the World. Uh, the state will have computers for identical and a fifth. The fifth one, you could change the software on. It was 
be overdue. Sufficient solid to get the shuttle sufficiently high that they could land it again, or would be able to land it from any point in the mission phase. It was simply the fallback computer, if the other four computers couldn't agree. And the first time they try to launch it, the four computers don't agree. They are out of step. And they, at finally, at some point, they do what programmers do in the end, they turn it off and turn it on. And they instead. And they say, we're going nowhere today. And they find out that actually during startup, there is a particular condition that means that one of the four computers can get one step ahead of the other ones. And that's So that establishes what we can think of as a baseline. This is the best code you can write. That's one book for 400,000 lines of code. The average productivity of the people who worked on the space shuttle software were less than one line of code a day. They had endless reviews. They had design reviews. They had reviews for the paper quality to write the result of the design review. They had reviews of the correct font and size selection for the text processing that did. But they wrote some damn good code. This is probably about as good as we can do it. Nobody has ever claimed to have done it better. The F-22 fighter was the first software-based fighter plane. It had two, around two million lines of code. And we know they had at least one bug. I'll tell you about it in a moment. That establishes a baseline that I don't believe is true of one error for two million lines of code. I don't believe that number. I believe there are bugs we have not heard about. I don't trust that. Um, the F-35 fighter will have four times as much code and four times as many bugs. No thanks, I don't want that job. Um, it has other problems too. I don't trust that number. Um, I think they're more, at best they're in the 400,000 number. Normally you'd say that quality programming gives you one buck for a thousand lines of code. I'm willing to give companies like Apple, Microsoft, Google, who has formal quality assurance, laboratories, procedures, employees, and say, you can do it twice as good. That means we probably have close to, you know, let's round up 50,000 bucks in OS X. That's your Macintosh right there. Uh, Windows 7, I haven't been able to find line of code numbers for, for the newer versions of Windows, but eh, 25,000, let's round it off a little bit. These are staggering numbers. Varnish is small, but we probably still have 100 bucks in it. And that's even filing away at our software quality for 11 years. We probably still have 100 bucks. Um, this is utterly staggering, problematic. Uh, people are piling random bits from GitHub, I call it a self-driving car. Um, I like my bicycle. <laughs> um, from a societal point of view, this is a problem. Back in 1979 or something, like Gary Weinberger said that if we built houses the way we write programs, the first woodpecker to come around would destroy civilization. And it's pretty much still on point. Um, we should think of lines of code not as an investment, but as a liability. We spent lines of code to do something. It's not a good thing to say, well, we have 10 million lines of code. It's like, dude. Um, it's kind of interesting to try to keep this updated. Every so often, you'll get a new number. Um, so about that F-22 bug. So the first time they, they deploy the F-22 abroad, they want to fly a squadron of them to Okinawa in Japan. They don't have the range for that, so they have tankers following them so they can tank two times before the 
Hawaii and uh, three times between Hawaii and Okinawa. When they cross the date line, the 180th of that, they go black. That's black. They have nothing. One of the pilots takes his flashlight and sends mortar signal up to the tanker saying, turn around, we follow. And they go back to Hawaii. That's one soft problem. The problem is, it could also have been a spelling mistake in an error message you'll never see. The problem is you don't know. How do we define a software bug? If we try to say, well, there are important software bugs, there are catastrophic software bugs, there are inconsequential software bugs, that's like shoveling water with a, with a fork. Well, is it catastrophic for you? How many people do we need to kill before we call it catastrophic? How much money do we need to do? Um, we can only really say it's a bug if we hit it. And it's indicative of the quality of the program that there are bugs in it. So, to avoid debugging, write simple code, write defensive code. If you make assumptions, put an assert there to document and patrol that assumption. Um, asserts cost nothing. It's, it's used to be a tradition that you'd have a search in your developer build and then you'd compile them out for the delivery build for performance reasons. Don't. Leave them in. It's out in the production environment that you hit your assumptions and find out they were not valid. Um, let programs write programs. A lot of programming is tedious, repetitive shit. You have to have a struct here, here you have to have a list of the members, here you have to print out to have a list, of, and so on. Automate that stuff, so you don't make trivial mistakes, copying and pasting stuff. And dump useful pro uh, information while you can. <coughs> this is one of my favorite quotes. It says, basically, debugging is twice as hard as programming. So you write a program as smart as you can. You're not smart enough to debug it. You should only write a code that you are smart enough to debug, which means you should run it about 50 power on your program. Because You'd need the other 50% when you come to debugging. Um, it's a very interesting observation. Um, there's a book from one of the first people to program an actual computer. Uh, and, and there's a quote from that which is wonderful. He says, I distinctly remember turning the corner before the stairs and realizing that a large part of the rest of my life I would be debugging programs. <laughs> So this is an example of defensive code in Varnish. This is total random snapshot of what I had on my screen when I made this slide. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's related to fetching something from the back end. So, um, it's probably easier to color code it. The red statements are asserts, pure asserts. <coughs> They assert that we know what state we're in. Uh, AC means assert zero. This should not have a value. This should have a zero value. There's a similar one called AN that assumes it's not zero. This is simply for convenience for the program. Um, check object not null. All our structs have as the first member an unsigned magic. And for that struct, we've defined a particular random number to be that magic number. So we have this macro, we take the pointer, we access the first word there, and we look, does that have the chromatic number? Because otherwise, I think it would have void pointer, went out as a worker, and came back as a request. It's a very typical error in SQL. So we check that the pointers we get are actually the same pointers, and that they're not null. We check that we do not have a storage line. We check that we do not have a storage hindi. STV next, the, the purple functions here, those functions we call into start out checking that things are same. The blue one is, is interesting. That's what we called out to the VCL programming language. So one of the things we did in Varnish is, how many have tried to, to configure squid? What do you think about squid.conf? Have you ever tried submitting it to the international obfuscated C code contest? Right. So 
what we did in Varnish was we made a small domain-specific language. So people write this VCL code, which is a pain programming language. Um, and we compile that to C code. Trivial compiler, it's nothing like uh, C GCC or Clang. It's just a simple interpretation of their code into C code. Then we compile the C code to a shared library and load that into the Varnish process and run it. That means no matter how complex people's configuration is, it runs at machine speed. If they want to have an if-then-else with 10,000 clauses, we will do that at machine speed. And we'll run it through your C compiler with optimization. So Clang will look at that and says, well, I can do a table lookup with them and do its thing. Um, that means complexity of your configuration has virtually no impact on your performance. It also means we have to call into this code and hope people write something sane. If they don't, well, they didn't. It's their problem. It's not my problem. Um, so we call into that one, and that one has a number of helper functions. So this compiler only generates function calls into a particular subset of the process. And all these functions as start out checking that things are sane. So if somebody did something weird, because one of the things you can do in VCL code is you can put inline C code there. They should always make an escape hatch. Right? So you can have inline C code, and you can call into MySQL or whatever you want. So at the other end of that, we have to check that they didn't royally screw up with a memory overflow or something in the meantime. So the net effect is that about 10% of all source lines in Varnish are asserts, which has this interesting side effect that about 10% of our source code we cannot test. Um, but when you have a program where you may have a Varnish server just set up default parameters will have a thousand or two thousand threads and if something goes wrong in that when they share the same data structure behind it if you don't stop right away when you first notice something is wrong you get a core dump that's very good entropy for your random number generator trying to pull something out of a core dump in Varnish is pointless close to pointless I can probably count on one hand the number of times I've done it um, so all these search stop as soon as we see the first sign of trouble. We caught up the worker process because we have two processes. The management process says, oh, I'll start another one. Because really, waking up people at 3 a.m. to start a process again, that was old in 2006, at least for me. <laughs> so let programs write programs. Um, this is an example where we have statistics parameters in Varnish. We put them in a piece of shared memory so that other processes can read the shared memory and take the counters out in real time without bothering the Varnish process. They just read a piece of shared memory. Um, they come in sets. We define randomly. We have this set of counters relating to backends or to locks or to whatever. Um, we don't know all of them at compile time. People can write extensions called vmods to Varnish and then we define the counters. So at compile time, we don't know which counters we have. So we need a mechanism for packaging these up somewhere. They access the cross the shared memory. And since we don't know what they are, the other program doesn't know about this VMO either. So the shared memory should include the description of the counters it has. Um, also, it would be nice to have documentation. He'll tell me. Um, this is the list of counters we have in Vanish whole engine we have these different sets and so on. So you take these, you run it through a Python program. Uh, this is what the file looks like. This looks like uh, markup from Sphinx. And that's because we may later turn it into that so we can stick it right into the documentation. So we say we have a begin that says these are called LCK, they're lock counters, they come in order 70 when you show them so that you can sort them. Um, and some documentation. We have one counter called create. It's a counter. It's a debug level. The one line description is create logs, blah, blah, blah. You write the stuff you need to tell about these counters as consistently and concisely as you can. Then you get a .h file out that defines a struct, which you can use from the C code. And you can just increment blab, arrow, create when you created one of these things. 
and you get a, a, a two function prototypes to create a set and to destroy a set. Easy peasy. The fun thing is it also gives a file. It starts out with a search to make sure all the members are in the right places where we expect them. These are static asserts, they will fail at compile time. You would never do this by hand. If you have 80 fields, that would be too much copy and paste. But you're doing it from a program. Just stick them in. They cost nothing. They cost, probably cost one millisecond at compile time. I can live with that. Then we have this thing. <coughs> That's probably one of the things I've had most questions about in my source code last year. This is gzipped JSON. Remember, I have to transfer a description of this set of counters through shared memory to this process that will show it on the screen to somebody. It needs to say, what is this counter? Is it a counter? Is it a gauge? Is it a bitmap? Uh, give me a one-line description. Give me a long description and so on. So we simply made a bunch of JSON. And then we gzip it and stick it in there as a binary blob. Then the program on the other end can take this binary blob, g unzip it, read it as a JSON, and now it knows that we have this counter that says number created locks, it's an integer, it's a counter, it has this size, blah, blah, blah. It's eight bytes into the structure. Works. Nice. And the point is, adding a new set of counters now, you just need, need to write up this very terse description of it. You don't need to have to hunt out eight different places in the source code where you have to add this one to the list and so on. It's endless amount of time. And finally, there's the two functions that allocate and, and, and free a set of counters by calling into the bodies runtime set. Uh, nice type safety and so on. Um, core dumps are not very useful to us. They contain 2,000 threads, in some cases 100,000 threads. You only care about one of them, the one that hit the assert. They contain many gigabytes. I've had people stress test SMTP, say, my van is crashed, I mailed you the core file, did you get it? And I'm like, it will probably be here in a week's time. <laughs> it's usually also full of confidential information people don't want to get to. Um, Vanish has their work content. It may have personal identifiable information controlled by EU regulations or Department of Commerce or New York Stock Exchange information. So basically, on average, users cannot share their data with us. I mean, if it's something like wasn't supposed yes, you're wrong. That was used three days ago, right? But um, I don't need that information. I'm not in that business. More generally, the debugger doesn't know the semantics of your data structures. It knows the layout, it knows the width, and so on, but doesn't know what the fields mean. It doesn't know how to interpret the data in a way that tells you something about it. Um, and it doesn't know about optimal formatting of your data either. Uh, it cannot look at a number and say, this one is smarter to print X, this one is smarter to print in decimal or octal or whatever you want to do. So write your own panic routine. This is what a panic looks like in Varnish. When an assert triggers, when we get a signal or something like that, we trip into our own panic routine, we dump information we care about. The panic is a version of the panic. send you a bug report and the version of Varnish are you run. It's included here. Varnish trunk, give revision which API version is it running on. IDET tells you what machine is. This is FreeBSD, 12 current, AMD, that's probably my laptop. Uh, it runs with no jail support. It runs with the default. What's my this? Oh, default software. This is usually, I wouldn't say it's usually not used. We use it but not very much.
our developers were DevOps were promoted to developers or side moded or down or whatever. I don't know what direction that is. I guess it would be integration because they lost the ops bit. Um, so we lost coverage testing, um, which meant we lost cross-platform testing. It used to be that, you know, we have this guy who runs on uh, SunOS and we have this other guy who runs on centers and, and we can always ask this guy who runs Red Hat 4 or something and so on. So I wrote a small shell script. It's a little bit larger than this, but it's basically do a git pull on our repo, run all our tests, send the results to us with an SSH, and if it went well, wait an hour, do it again. Otherwise, wait 10 minutes and try again. Um, the SSH is, is a, a little interesting little detail. Um, that's because I want to know who sent results. I don't want anybody jamming up the system with random bogus data. So um, when you run the script the first time, it generates an SSH key for you, which will be used to report these things. You have to send that to me. So I can ask you silly questions like, what computer are you running this on? Where can I contact you if I have questions? And then we have a, a small web backend that spits out a pigeon HTTP ta or HTML table because I had to write this and I'm not a web developer. Until 2008, my homepage were written in HTML1 in VI. Um, I'm not much of a web developer. But we have this system and it will run continuously. And green means it's never been, it's never failed with this version. And it's not green if there's been any failures downstream for that one. And we run it across, I think, 12 machines in total. Some of them run continuously. Some of them run when people boot their laptops. Um, one thing you'll notice is uh, there's an ARM computer here. That's actually a BeagleBone Black I have running in my lab. Just because I want to see that we can run small machines still. Unfortunately, the, the SD card is sort of dying from all the, the work it does, so it's not running too well right now. Uh, the ARM64 is a uh, Raspberry Pi 3. Works fine. Um, so build a good test tool. Maintain your test tool. Whenever you need to do something new, think about how you will test it with the test tool. So the other thing of this is that one of these clients, one of the ones I run, runs with code coverage testing. Your compiler can insert counters in your code so that if you have an if-then-else, it will add two counters. How many times did you take if and how many times did you take else? It's called GCOV, and you have it if you're running GCC. Uh, you probably have it on your system and never used it. You should. But the point is, when we run all our test cases, we can take all this data out, run through some Python, generate this nice, you can click around through the different files, and it will say, here's a bit of code you haven't tried. We've not tested this code. It may or it may not work. In this case, it's an, it's an error condition. But it would still be silly for it to call up. Right? So I should go in and try to, to write a test case to cover those five lines of code. At some point, it gets silly. You have tests which are very hard, if not downright impossible to trigger, but which are important to cover. In which case, what we've done is Vanish D has a flag that can be set that says, you're running in test mode. And certain places in the code it will say, I'll just sleep two seconds here when I'm in test mode, so that the other end can do what needs to be. Um, and we have, we have a package so that we can synchronize. In the Vanish test language, um, you can synchronize. You can say, send this request and wait until we are all ready. And then you can send this other request and wait until we're all ready. And then in the back end, you can receive the request and you say, now I'm ready. And then this one can pass and so on, this synchronization thing. And they can actually also go in and synchronize against the VCL code people or you write in the test codes for Vanish and so on. But at some point, you have to say, OK, this line, I'll just have to stare at it and conclude that will work, because testing it is just too much work. And all of us as search are untested, because really, 
fail on the 519th Malak call? Okay, now fail on the 520th Malak call? No, nobody's going to do that in, in the same state of mind. Um, this goes up on the web page, and this is one of the places where it's important to follow, track your, your progression over time. So, uh, all, live, all directories and all source files have this little uh, spark line graph. So, these are day, this is today, this is yesterday, blah, blah, week, one week, two week, month, years. So we go all the way, uh, sort of a logarithmic scale, go all the way back to 2007, I think. Um, and the interesting thing is, usually when you add a feature, you cover its drops. And then you have to go back and write a test case and get it covered. I can't remember what we added here. Probably HTTP2, I think. Yeah, that would be HTTP2. And we don't actually have coverage testing. We kind of worked on it a little bit, but we're not back up in the green area. Our goal is 92% code coverage. That's basically all the code that's not a source. We're not there. There's some code that, one of the things is we have the GCIP library. And there's a lot of the GCIP library we don't use. So do we write test cases for that? Nah, no. On the other hand, I could comment a lot of it out, but I want to keep the delta to the real ellipses as small as possible, so I don't want to stick a lot of, of noise in there. So there's some places where we'll have to suffer a, a lower um, coverage, but I want to get that number back above 0 0.9 at the very least for our next release. I should talk about that a little bit. Um, so one of the problems in open source is that you can set up goals for your next release. And that's nice. And you can also dream about getting a poem. The date will come. The features? Eh, maybe not. So um, the problem about that is as you approach the agreed upon release date and these features are not ready, there's a big temptation to say, ah, we'll just postpone the release a month. Then surely, right. And you keep slipping and slipping. And the longer you slip, the longer your release cycle becomes. And the more important it gets for people to get their feature in right before the release, because otherwise they'll have to wait two years for the next release, right? So you get into this mad, negative reinforcement thing where your releases keep slipping because people keep stuffing things in them because other, they can't wait for the next one because that's surely going to slip also. So at some point, I did FreeBSD 5. How many remember FreeBSD 5? Right. It slipped by two and a half years? Something like that. Because something dot com something. No, I'm, I'm seriously. Half our developers were suddenly not in the IT business anymore. I was like, where did they go? Quite a wreck here, isn't it? Um, I tried to persuade the FreeBSD product to do this, and they're sort of edging that way, but not quite done that. In mine, we've gone all out. We release September 15th and March 15th. Twice a year. And we release that day. That's whatever we have. We'll make sure it works. We'll try to test it, try to get people to test run it. But that's what's in the release. And that's why we had 5.1.1, 5.1.2, and 5.1.3 in three weeks. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's supposed to work, isn't it? It's not perfect. But the point about it is, you can sit here, you have this feature, it's almost ready. And it's like, no, I cannot make that before September 15th. But you know, the next train leaves on March 15th. You're not going to have to wait two and a half years to get into a release. You know, six month time, we'll be in there. We're fine. We don't have to have these cramming sessions to stop things. Um, so, one of the things I have on my list before the March 15th release is to get that number back up. Will it happen? Yeah, who knows. But I'll try. It's kind of a point of pride for me. So, you also want to test on big Indian and little Indian platforms. And that's getting to be surprisingly hard. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I have the ARM machine in there. 
Ideally, you'd also want to test on machines with strict alignment. Machines that cannot load an integer that's not aligned on four bytes or eight bytes or whatever, and stuff like that. That's also getting increasingly hard because architectures are converging on the least common denominator for Windows programmers or something. Um, but I keep the ARM machines running for that reason. We have SonOS machines running on Spark. Actually, do we? I think we still have one Spark running. Um, I'd like to get a PowerPC machine in there. I tried running it on a uh, access point, which had a MIPS CPU. It had a USB port. I could put FreeBSD on it, external USB hard drive. Hey, plenty it works fine. And I have an emergency backup access point if I need. Um, I just built a house and moved, so I haven't unpacked all my stuff yet, so that's why it's not running right now. Um, 32-bit, 64-bit, we'll talk about that. You want to test with both GCC and LLVM. Um, I could kill those people. <laughs> I'm so happy we got LLVM because GCC were getting to be a bunch of nasty assholes. Who's like, we're the compiler guys, we don't have to care. So LLVM ended that. And now we have this competition between them where one of the sub goals, I think you get like three brownie points, is to come up with a warning option where you can warn about something the other guy doesn't warn about. Right. So let me guess, what happens if you pass this warning option to the other compiler? Does it say, oh, this is a warning I don't understand about, so I'll just ignore your option? Or does it say, oh, and exit two? Right. I'm at the point where I'm thinking about writing a piece of C preprocessor code so that I can say, well, if this is LLVM and it's larger than blah, 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 I want minus, and if this is, and then I can run it through CPP and get out the list of options I want to pass to my compiler. I've not done it yet because I have this feeling that's, you know, one, one the step before you end up in insanity gets uncomfortably small if you have to do that kind of stuff. Um, isn't that why you have all the rules? <laughs> <laughs> you can't win this, can you? <laughs> Um, LLVM has added some very interesting static analyzers tools and, and semi-dynamic analyzers tools. We're starting to use them. Federico has been setting it up. Um, uh, uh, UBSAN that looks for undefined behavior. There's other things in C that's undefined, such as writing programs and running programs. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's very good, but the point is, Anything you can lay your hand on, run your source code through it. And if it comes out and emits a warning, fundamentally that means your code is not expressing what it wants to express. So that this tool, whatever it is, can understand it. If your compiler comes out with a warning, that's because you have not written your program in a way the compiler really understands. So rewrite your program. This is, this sounds like some, some sort of race to the bottom, right? We can use integer variables, we can use you know, plus minus, multiply, it's sort of shaky, um, but it isn't. It's a matter of expressing precisely what it is you want to do. Asserts are very good for that. You can say, I know this is not a null point at this point. Trust me. And this one will explode if it is, so I will know. And it comes out and says, I cannot understand why this pointer is not invalid. Well, explain to it in the source code, not in a comment, in the source code, explain to the tool, this pointer, uh, pointer is valid because assert, blah, 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 fine, done. Um, coverity, same story. Uh, coverity is an interesting tool. Um, we use coverity and flexilint. Uh, some of you will remember from old Unix World magazines there were these weird ads with bug of the month number 355 and there would be like five lines of C code with some obscure bug in it and you'd spend 15 minutes and you'd figure, oh, that's unsigned, right, right? And then I think two pages down they had the solution or they printed up 
upside down underneath? I don't know. They had, the solution was somewhere else you could find. Um, there's a company called Gimbal Software, and they are somewhere, they're stuck in the 1980s from a business point of view, unfortunately. But the tool is, is, is great. It's a linked program. The difference here is that Coverity is sort of taking the computer science approach and trying to do static analysis, value tracking, blah, 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 and says, well, this, blah, blah, blah. And it comes out with these kind of, I wouldn't say theoretical uh, questions for you, because they're very practical, but, but they come, you, you feel like it's a computer science professor who says, ah, in step three, that lemma is not solid, right? Coverity, or uh, Flexilin, on the other hand, he has worked with programmers for uh, since 1582 or something like that. It will say things like, you have a constant here that has a lowercase l. Did you mean l or did you mean 1? Because there were programmers who grew up in typewriters where you used the lowercase l as a digit 1. Right? So if you want to have a long constant, use a capital L to show that you know what you're doing. Right? Um, it, will, it was the first tool I know that would say, your indent is skewed here. That line is further out or further in than it should be. It looks for programmer errors. So they complement each other fantastic well. They, they, they sort of find entirely different kinds of bugs. Um, we talk about the sanitizers. We have private consistency scripts. Uh, we have a coding convention we stole start line from FreeBSD, um, but we have other conventions which include files go together which don't go together and so on. And so I have probably about 20 small scripts that will run through the source code and say, are these things consistent the way we want them to be consistent? For instance, all our statistics counters, is there actually some code somewhere counting them up? Or do we have, you know, counted, we deleted the code but we forgot to delete the counter? Stuff like that. Um, keep polishing your code until it shines like a diamond. There's no bug that's too small to not fix. It only takes, you know, 30 seconds to fix the bug and, I don't know, 10 minutes to figure out how to use the git command or something. Um, we have a very low bar. We will fix white space errors. <coughs> just on the general principle of it. Um, I don't suffer from OCD. Um, I have the more severe form that's called CDO, where you have to sort the letters alphabetically. Um, no, it's not that, but being consistent is the easiest way to avoid silly bugs. Um, I worked early in my career with a couple of accountants. I worked at Commodore Data, remember 64s? So, depending who you talk to, Commodore is famous for either the Commodore 64, the Amiga, or inventing offshore tax sheltering. So I was in the finance department running computers. I saw tax sheltering being invented in front of my eyes. And I saw the accountants that tried to stop it. And they had some very neat tricks. Uh, accountants will do all sorts of weird consistency checks. They'll go down, they'll take a random record and say, how did you process this one? Go through from start to end and see how it was processed. And then they'll go backwards and say, show me all other transactions that were treated that way and see if they follow the same stuff. <laughs> it's amazing what they can find in Commodore Data or an oil company and stuff like that in the Department of Creative Accounting. You should do the same thing. Do checks across your code. We have this parameter. Do we always have it as const behind this point of the code? Or is it not const behind this point? Um, that helps finding silly box and it helps avoiding a technical death in the code. To, you, get, you get into the, diff, there's a tendency to write some code and forget about it for 10 years and then you come back and it's like, what, what idiot wrote this? Oh, oh, right. Getting, taking a walk through the code so you get all over the code base, say every two or three years, is a good thing. You come over and look, 
that looks exactly like that. We need a library function, right? Or rather, more often, that, 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 and that looks exactly like each other. We need a library function, right? Um, so, so, love your source code. It also makes it a lot easier to show it to people. I have absolutely no qualms, like I did a couple of slides ago, take a random slab of one inch code, throw it on a slide, go up in front of people and say, this is... Because I know the probability of one of them saying, oh, look, <laughs> is very, very low, because I know I've been over it. It still happens, though. Um, the panic dump I showed you, when I copied and pasted that, I found out we cut the first character off the operating system name, so I was actually running uh, rebsd. So I fixed that today. This is our covariety report chart, and I particularly like the one about defect density zero. Of course it's not, but it means at least covariety cannot figure it out. Um, covariety has a modeling language which I refuse to use. Um, we used it in FreeBSD because the kind of work shit you do in a Unix kernel is kind of hard to explain in the source code, which is why kernel programmers are weird. Um, sometimes you simply have to explain that what looks like a VM page here is actually a file over there, and it's the same thing because it cannot look through and know that your hardware will, and stuff like that. But I don't want to do it for Varnish, because Varnish is a user my program, and it doesn't do anything particularly weird. So we do get a number of false positives, what, where Coverity will come out and say, you cannot possibly do this, because somebody may have written not a number in this double. And I'm like, dude, no. I know they didn't. Um, so, these are mostly false positives that we have dismissed, dismissed and said, sorry, you got it wrong, guys. That is not a bar. Um, a couple of them have been, I have flagged for coverage and said, you should have been able to figure that one out because blah, 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 blah. And they've come back and said, hmm, 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 hmm. We'll come back to you. And they never do. Um, and we fixed 95, uh, which uh, some of them we have fixed for covariety um, on the principle of things. Uh, you can have some function that will nine times out of 10 probably deallocate the memory it allocated. And the 10th time, is going to return an error code which turns into exit two moments later and you didn't bother. Well, free buff, done. Right. It's technically correct and it would change the overall structure and call it in other circumstances. Maybe we would want to, to do that. Um, we have, so, so Vanish is a weird kind of program because we have the management process and the worker process is the same program. The management process will fork but keep running it, we'll not do an exec. And we have vastly different uh, environments in those two processes. The management process is not threaded. It's a single thread. It has a very simple task. We don't want to deal with locking in it. The child process, the worker process, has thousands of threads and, and tons of locking. And some, they have one data structure they share, which is set up by the manager, passed to the, the worker process, but the other, the private management stuff shouldn't be seen by the, the, the cash process. Well. And, and by it, like, Coverity finds some weird stuff because it doesn't know about this firewall down and through the middle of our source code. Um, we try to fix that so we can explain to Coverity that this is not gonna happen, we know that. Um, I think what I would call genuine box, Coverity has found about five. Um, none of them horrible. Some of them could lead to a crash in random circumstances. 
and the management process will restart varnish and it will continue. That's actually that's a, that's a, a anti pattern we see. People set up varnish and it seems to run and well, that's fine and forget about it. And actually, what happens is it's running for five minutes, core dumps starts. Running for five minutes, core dumps starts. And at some point, they start to wonder about performance and they come in and look at it and it's like, oh, maybe I shouldn't run out of disk space all the time or whatever that happens. Um, but um, as far as I recall, we have not had any oh shit thing come out of Kubernetes. And that's because we tried to explain in our source code what happens. And because we tried to explain what happens with all these asserts and so on, we also found the kind of box that Kubernetes would find. Um, I discovered this little pop-up thing you could press on the other one. And that's kind of interesting relative to, to the table about source code quality I had earlier. These are the numbers they're seeing in open source projects. So if you have less than 100,000 lines of code, you have about um, 350 bucks per uh, thousand lines of code. So now you have, yeah, so, so that's about one third of, of the one box per thousand lines of code, right? So Coverity can spot a third of the box typical code will have. What, what I find kind of interesting here is that it grows with project size and then it starts to drop. Um, that's kind of an interesting observation. I don't know if it's statistically significant at this point, but I could imagine that, yes, once you get into the size of, you know, Apache, uh, FreeBSD, you start, you, you cannot get to that size and still be a viable project without thinking somehow about quality control. And, and that is probably the reflection here. The question is how big a backlog of box you build up getting there and how long time it takes for you to come back down. If this number, does this number ever get back down or is that simply the level you, you sort of plateau at as a project? Um, so I promised myself to track this one over time with the updated just to see how it how it goes. But it kind of underscores the one buck per thousand lines of code is not totally, it may be even a bit optimistic. I don't know. Lesson number five, handle the bug reports right away. This one we utterly failed in FreeBSD. Uh, when I started Varnish, the oldest bug report in FreeBSD was from 1996 still open. And we had 12,000 other things. Basically, they were useless. They didn't help anybody with anything. And when I started Vinus, I said, that's not going to happen again. Um, bug reports don't age. If you come back three weeks later, people cannot really remember which one of the machines it was. There used to be a call number, but some, um, no, that may have been lost, right? Um, and if you have too many of them, it's all like, oh, that's 200 bucks. I'm never going to get through it, so I might as well not start. And you're on the head, path to free BSD's mess. Um, and also Discord, I don't know about you, but when I look around for something to use, you know, I need a library that does. One of the first thing I do is I go to the bug tracker, right? Is this project alive? Right. And you see bug report number one, two, three, four, five, six, none of them touched. Okay, bye. Um, so having a bug tracker that actually shows the project is alive and cares about bugs, at least for me, I'm sure there's people as weird as me out there in this respect, sends the signal to the users that we're actually trying to do a job here. So the thing that I invented in, uh, in Varnish is sort of problematic in the sense that we're a very Eurocentric project. So we schedule this Monday, 1 p.m. 13 o'clock European time. We have what we call the bug bush. And we have the developer ERC channel. And we'll go on the developer ERC channel Monday at 1 o'clock. Whoever's there is there. And we'll go through the new tickets. Number 2467. People will read it. The, the thing we want to decide is, one, can we use this report for anything? 
Sometimes you get bug reports that says, one is crashed. No shit, Sherlock. Right. If we can do something about it, what are we going to do about it? Is there somebody who's going to say, I'll, I'll, I don't think I know what this is, I'll deal with it. Do we need to get more information? If we need to get more information, who contacts the person and says, can you get us this information? And so we try to find out how we're going to act on this bug report. And if we cannot act on it, we close it. <coughs> yes, one is crashed. Sorry, we cannot really do anything with this level of information. Open a new ticket if you have more information you would like to see. <laughs> Done. Um, we encourage people who submit box to hang around at that time if they can. And that's kind of problematic for people in Asia and US. Sometimes they do it. I tried to do a, a two-step bug watch where we have one European time and then one later on Mondays, but that didn't really work out. Um, kind of got lonely. <laughs> I, I should probably try it for a longer period in advertising. But this actually works for us. Um, I have a personal pain limit of 50 open box and pull requests. When it gets to 50, I will actively go in and dedicate time to getting it back down onto 50. Um, unless I'm building a house. Um, the ideal number or the, the optimum number seems to be around 25, 30. We don't seem to be able to get it lower than that. Because some tickets are hard to deal with and will survive for a long time until we re-architect the necessary bits to fix this bug and stuff. Um, but it's really important, I think, for, for the, both for the spirit, for the project, for the, for the esprit de corps, and, and for, for the public perception of the project, that you deal with tickets. Even, even if you tell people, yes, that's how it works, live with it. We don't have a workaround. That's actually helping them. They're not sitting there waiting for something to happen to this bug report. So even giving decisively negative feedback on a bug report is better than not giving any feedback. Um, this is the number of CVEs, critical vulnerability entries, entities, uh, extraterrestrials. Yeah, probably we'll take that. Yeah. Um, over time, and um, it kind of underscores the one per thousand lines of code thing. Um, this is the total number pulled out of um, uh, Mitra's web tool. Um, this is for Varnish. Um, we're doing pretty well. Um, We've not had any real bad ones until August this year. I'll tell you about that one in a moment. Um, the worst one we had really was this one. That was a Barney's version 4. That was reported one and a half year after we released Barney's 4. Uh, Barney's 3, this one was Barney's 3. We had released Barney's 4 one and a half year before. Pretty much all users had updated that one. Um, so we've, we've been having a good ride in this respect. So obviously our focus on software quality has something to do with it. But I think also we live in an obscure place in the sandwich, what's called the web sandwich, in that we're not the web server. So the web developers don't really see the cache. And the users don't see it either. We're sort of like a router box somewhere in the middle. So when things go wrong with Varnish, I think very often somebody else gets the blame. Um, there is an exception to that, and that is if Varnish cannot get hold of the backend web server, we put up this 503 Guru meditation page. I worked at Commodore, what can I do, right? And I don't know if, if you remember that Norway got dust by China back in 2008. Um, that was me. So we had a link to the Varnish project homepage on that 503 Guru Meditation page. 
and then the Chinese state railroads installed varnish. <laughs> and when Chinese people try to book a train ticket and get a page in a language they don't understand with a single link, they will click on this link <laughs> and be taken to a web server in Red Pill Impro's data center in Oslo which did surprisingly well because it was running Manish. <laughs> Whereas the fibers between China and Norway were rapidly increasing in temperature. <laughs> that was a fun one. Um, fortunately, we managed to, to get it to stop. Uh, rent we, we simply changed the DNS record to point Vanish Castor to the Chinese state railroads <laughs> until we have talked to them. Um, <coughs> yeah, the kind of shit you do. We're run out, running out of time. Oh, really? You mean yeah. you're running out of tape? <laughs> yeah. We're getting close. Lesson number six, know who your friends are. You never know when you'll need the help. And this is about that bug. We still have bugs in Varnish, and we had one in August where a specially crafted HTTP request would call on the Varnish instance. Um, we could provide workarounds for this one, um, and we came out of it pretty well. We had thought about how we would do this, but we never tried it before. So how do we get a CV number? under embargo. Well, transpires they've changed that three times since last time I did it in the free basic project. Are there any special users we should warn early? Like, you know, White House, BBC, Wikipedia? Who knows? And if you warn some of them, who's going to be angry that you didn't warn them? The Chinese state railroads? Can you afford to have those as enemies? I have no idea. Um, we lacked liaisons in certain projects that would, were rolling varnish into their open source project. It's like, dude, you have a problem. Hello, hello, right? Is there anybody? And our only excuse is we never tried it before. Um, there's some perverse incentives in security which surprised me. So I finally found out where I was supposed to go through the door to get a CV number and I said, can you give me an embargo CV number? You'll get the details on Wednesday. Long email thread. Concluding with, yes, I could give you one, but since you never asked for these before, I don't know whether you deserve it. <laughs> As in, your software is not buggy enough to get an embargo CV number. What? I've been told otherwise that this particular person, quote, He's so German, he had to leave Germany. <laughs> um, but that one surprised. That's why we invented the uh, VSV, Varnish Security Vulnerability Numbers. <laughs> and then we could glue the CVE number on later, right? Um, we flew entirely under the radar. And thank goodness for that. I think part of the reason is very few people know that Varnish delivers 20% of web content. So, including this very German guy, he probably didn't know. I mean, if he had Googled my name, he'd probably find the Varnish project. Did you know what Varnish did? Nah. Our homepage doesn't exactly flash out that everybody belongs to it. You know, all your web page are belong to us or something like that. Um, and it was the first serious CV in the project. It's not like somebody like whitehouse.gov had a manual that says, when we receive a CVE on Varnish, step one, step one A, one one A, one, right? Nobody in the other had, you know, nobody was going to raise the panic. Nobody was going to call the white and say, the White House is totally on edge, right? So, so we flew entirely under the radar. And we could do that because we could tell people, stick this in your VCL code, and it won't happen to you. For, for Vinus 5, just this one line. For Vinus, for Vinus 4.1, these 20 lines of inline C code. Use copy and paste.
But the inline C code saved our ass in this case. Because we could basically go in there, put C code that went down, took the data structure, did right. Um, that's a very no that, that's very important for us because the people who install the Varnish package have root bits. The people who run Varnish are some of these kind of heavy duty web developers, uh, content management people who no sane root should ever give a root bit. So they cannot upgrade Varnish. But they can go into the VCL code, they can copy and paste 20 lines, and they can done. So that's a very, we've been talking about removing the inline C code thing. It's staying. It saved our bacon, right? Lesson number seven, prepare for the long haul. Write code you can live with for many years. People will come back and haunt you with 20 years old code. And you look at it and you think, Jesus. Um, do it right the first time. Save time and embarrassment. Resist the quick workarounds. It's always a tempting, oh, we just need this one feature so we can. Let's do it right. Yeah, you can wait and release sack. I'm sorry, make your own hack. We'll do it the right way. Always consider the architectural point of view in these things. Don't make special cases. Make systems, frameworks, APIs, so that the next thing that comes around can slot right in. And don't be afraid to renovate. Go back to the old code and say, can we do this smarter today? Yeah, there's a new algorithm that's much better at this than what we did install. Don't burn out and try to secure some funding so you can afford this hobby. 11 years is a long time. It's a really long time. Um, my kids are so embarrassed I use this picture. <laughs> so avoid the technical debt. Do it right, even if it takes longer. It takes shorter time in the long run. Trust me. Redo it right when you know what right is. Stick a triple X comment there saying, revisit this when I'm older and wiser. Keep a consistent style. It helps all the way through. And re-architect, generalize, make APIs out of things so that you can plug in things and some, so other people can write code and plug in so you don't have to write the code. Don't burn out. Try to get a good thing going. Try to enjoy what you're doing. Try to make what you're doing something you enjoy doing. Uh, don't do anything you hate now or will hate later. It's not worth it. Not even for money. Trust me. Neil Gaiman famously said once that anything he had ever done for the money, he had regretted. And usually he didn't even get the money. Um, don't be afraid to say no to bad ideas. I don't care who comes with a bad idea. Bad idea is a bad idea. What people like when you say There's no need to piss on them. Remember to delegate and trust people. That's very hard for programmer types. Like, we know there's two kinds of code, the code I wrote and the rest of the crap. Right? You need to learn to delegate. You need to trust people. You need to grow people. You need to give people challenges. That, I know this is kind of tricky code, but you want to look at this ticket. We can talk about it. Um, take a break. If you sit there, angry in front of your computer, there's so many other things you can do that's so much more rewarding and you'll get exactly as much done. Watch the dog, walk the dog, whatever, do something. And ignore the fraud police. There's a link here to a uh, commencement speech by Amanda Palmer, the musician, where she explains what the fraud police is. I met them myself. We've been building a house. And whenever I was sitting there late at the evening looking at drawings and stuff like that, and I had this feeling, you know. In a moment, it's going to knock on the door. There's going to be some dude from the city council there with a clipboard. And he's going to look at me and he'll say, don't you know that only grown-ups build houses? <laughs> You'll never escape this feeling. It's like, Washington Post runs my code? White House runs? U.S. Marines run my code, right? It never stops. But at some point, you get to the point where you say, yeah, so fucking what? <laughs> it's that problem. I can recommend it. It's, it's very entertaining. Secure funding. 
this is, is one of my, my crusades right now. Just because it's called free and open software doesn't mean it's gratis. Somebody has to care about software quality if you want software quality. Bugs don't fix themselves. Heartbleed. They had, I think, three and a half hours funded per year for maintenance. The rest of the time, they were chasing contracts for certification of open system with all the bugs. The way I've done it is I've created what's called the Vanish Moral License, which is basically a sponsorship. But it's called a license because then it ends up in the computing department rather than marketing, because if it ends up in marketing, you get binders full of Pantone color slips. Basically, send me money, I'll keep working on Vanish. And that keeps my bread buttered. I've been able to explain to these companies, you build a company on Vanish. You can afford to send me some money to make sure you still have the tool the year after next year, and the year after that, and the year after that. And people are receptive to these things. If you come up with software quality, if you say, this is what we're doing for you, we're delivering you a tool you can build your business on, they can find somewhere where they can sell a photocopy and give you the money instead of something. They'll find a way. And lesson number eight is, enjoy it. This is the only life you get. Whatever you do, that is your life. Enjoy it. If you don't like what you're doing, you're doing it wrong. You should be doing something else. Or you should be doing it differently. Or you should be doing it for a different reason. But it's very hard to learn. Once you start to get successful with a software project, you feel the weight piling in. As in, we have this thing where you can dust 20% of all web traffic in the world. That was not a good day. And then, after a cup of tea, I sat down and said, you know, it's taken 11 years to get here. I can live with that. And then I enjoyed it. <laughs> so.